Bahraini security forces have this morning stormed protesters at the Pearl Roundabout. That's after at least two people were killed and hundreds wounded in clashes between anti-government protesters and Bahrain's security forces yesterday. The king has imposed a state of emergency after calling in foreign troops to quell the protests. Jeff has made his way to Abu Dhabi and is uh, talking to business leaders trying to gauge reaction to the crisis in the Middle East and, of course, no doubt the uh, events unfolding in Japan. Jeff. Yeah, and uh, I would say there's a, a good deal of shock and some surprise, perhaps, that events have deteriorated in quite the way they have in Bahrain through the last 48 hours or so. And it's interesting catching up with business people here to get their reaction to the direction in which this story now seems to be traveling. I have with me Kali Janahi. He's a Bahrain-born banker, now with a Faisal uh, private bank in Switzerland. Um, Kali, thank you for giving us your time. You. Um, just if you could give me your reaction to how things are developing now in Bahrain. Well, I mean, uh, as, you, as you said, what's been happening in the past 48 hours is totally gone against what was expected, which was a dialogue in Bahrain, a national dialogue between the ruling family and the different parties in the country. Uh, now, we are where we are today, uh, but knowing Bahrain, you, most of you know what Bahrain is, a small little island, we cannot go forward without the dialogue. So there is no way out but the dialogue. So we are hoping that this is going to be a very, very sort of temporary uh, measure which has been done. Uh, I was there uh, a day ago uh, for 48 hours. Certainly it's really bad in terms of the sectarial divide and the mental aspect of the people, the way they've gone. So you go to villages, people are basically 15 to 20 year old kids sitting there and not to allow people in or out depending on which sect they come from and to know them we cannot protect you if you are from a different sect. So things have really gone out of hand. The emotionality has really gone out of hand. But we have to deal with this and deal with it right. And what I'm hoping for that the dialogue is going to be forthcoming fairly fast. Of course, we're going to need a bit of time to cool off after what's happened, especially yesterday, in terms of the emergency measures. But as you and I know, business-wise, that's not going to be great news for everyone. Now, now would you anticipate that the, um, the ruling family will make significant concessions here? You only have to look at the structure of society in Bahrain to see how dominant the ruling family is in every part of the economy. Are they going to have to give up some control over these areas to get some kind of peace agreement with the protesters? Well, the Crown Prince, who was given basically the, the full support by His Majesty the King to have the dialogue, and he said that 48 hours ago, that he gave the opposition a lot of concessions, which included basically having the government elected, sort of sort of elected government, having full parliament with full powers, going through the issue of sectarial perspective. And by the way, sectarianism and Bahrain, this is my personal belief, that in the past 10 years, with the openness, we created more sectarial polarization than we should have done, because we allowed basically political societies, let's call them parties in sort of in the Western terms, political parties with sectarial background, whether Sunnis or Shias. And that has created a lot of sectarial divide that we have. What I'm hoping for in the future, whatever happens, that we're going to go with a culture of meritocracy rather than have a culture of nepotism and the basically what I would call balancing sectarial aspect in terms of the full aspect of running the country. How, how vulnerable do you think the banking system is in Bahrain at this point? Because I would imagine that foreign banks are unwilling to put capital into Bahrain at this point. Well, I mean, capital, of course, need, needs stability to basically to go somewhere. So I'm sure a lot of the banks would not put money into Bahrain, whether it is lending or it is even in, in, in investing in Bahrain for the short term. So we need to have some short-term measures. We did not have these short-term measures in 2008. Bahrain actually did survive. Yeah, there were a couple of banks which were supported because they were supported big time without mentioning the names, but other banks were not getting the support in terms of liquidity or capital increase. I think now we do need some sort of basically what is been coming in from the GCC. Some money has to go into the financial system to allow people basically to take their deposit they want to and to invest in the country because there's no other way to do it. Now. Nobody, I think, thought that 
the events in Egypt and North Africa would spread ultimately to this part of the Middle East. Um, we, are, we are where we are. Do you think now that neighbours of Bahrain should be increasingly concerned, or at least the authorities, that these protests will now spread to the rest of the region? Well, I, I don't think it's a question of protest. We are in, we are in, in the new millennium. We are in the sort of 20... 11 now. The world has changed, whether we like it or not. People are saying we are no longer subjects, we are citizens. Now, each country is going to deal with this differently. So the inclusiveness of the people is very, very important. Now, the Gulf region as a whole, of course, is going to be more immune than the North African countries simply because of the wealth availability. But that does not mean people don't want dignity, they don't want justice, they don't want to be included, they don't want to be heard, they don't want to make their governments accountable. So I think there'll be a lot of reforms happening in this part of the world in totality. But Bahrain has its own specificities. Bahrain actually was the most open country after them all for the past 10, 15 years. And, you know, the Bahraini people, by their nature, by being an island, they've been much more open, much more inclusive. So that, like, started in Tunis. Tunis was the most educated country in the Arab world. So things started there. So Bahrain has got the same thing. So this is the mass issue. I don't think it's something strange that people say we want to be citizens. We no longer want to be subjects. And I think this has been recognized by the, by the king and by the crown prince. I mean, that's been said, said publicly. So I think what we're hoping for, that this Bahraini thing is going to be resolved by the Bahrainis themselves through dialogue rather than being forced upon by anyone from outside, regardless of who that the outsider is. Thank you very much indeed for giving us your time, Thank sir. You.